This week, Facebook banned several high-profile accounts that it says engage in violence and hate, including white supremacist, Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, and a number of right-wing commentators, including Alex Jones. In the wake of live-streamed attacks and published threats, there are new calls for social media companies to do more to block extremism and hate. At Facebook, thousands of real people, known as moderators, are the front lines of this battle, looking and listening to some horrific material. I recently spoke with Casey Newton, Silicon Valley editor for The Verge, who reported on the toll this content is taking on Facebook moderators. This is not just in the context of the New Zealand attacks. This is something that is structurally built in so that basically there are people who see things on Facebook so that the rest of us don't have to, right? That's right. Anytime you see something on Facebook that you don't like, you can click a button to report it. And if you do that, a human being will look at it and determine whether it violates Facebook's community standards or not. Uh, a lot of the stuff they see is benign, but a lot of it is really uh, shocking and disturbing. And some of that can have a long term toll on their lives. So what kind of things, without getting too graphic, what kind of things are Facebook moderators looking at pretty much all day? It's shift work. That's right. I mean, some of the things that folks have described to me would include violence from drug cartels, uh, might include terrorist uh, content from ISIS, uh, child exploitation, uh, and, you know, uh, sort of every flavor of uh, violence that you can imagine. And so they are expected to do what? And at what pace and what speed do they look at this stuff and decide what to do with it? Yeah, so their goal for images uh, is to remove those within about 15 seconds, and with videos, it's about 30 seconds. And over the course of the day, they might be asked to make 300 decisions, uh, sometimes even 400 decisions. And one of the reasons that's very difficult is because the policy changes almost every day as moderators get new guidance about which posts will and will not be allowed to stay up. Um, we should also say that they are evaluated based on their accuracy. So if they take something down and they weren't supposed to, uh, that's a black mark on their record. And if they have just a few of those over a week-long period, they can be fired. So is there a fine line on what is and what is not allowed on Facebook as a platform? Absolutely. If you just read through the guidelines on nudity, for example, something that you might think would be relatively easy to define what would and would not be allowed, it's actually incredibly detailed. It's a very long section of the guidelines, and it goes into breathtaking detail about exactly which body parts and how much of which body parts can be depicted in a photo or video. And then, of course, there are you know dozens of other categories uh, that moderators need to familiarize themselves with and then never make a mistake. In that case, you can technically see what's happening. Sometimes it's audio as well. I mean, is there, is there a line, what you can hear, what you can see, what's implied, and then what's freedom of speech? Exactly. Well, you know, so what you're getting at is that we're asking these folks to make judgment calls, right? If you accept that much of our political discussions now take place on social networks, then the folks who are moderating this content are essentially first responders. They're on the front lines, and we've entrusted them with these really fundamental questions of safety and security. And while we've given them voluminous guidelines from which to apply the policy, the truth is that some of these are always going to be judgment calls. I had moderators tell me about cases where they would be told to take a post down, and they would do that, and then later they would be told, oh, no, no, leave it back up, and then hours later, take it back down again. It's, it's that kind of uh, intricate of a decision-making process. It's very fast. It's very fluid. And folks just change their minds. So it's incredibly difficult work that, of course, is also very low paid. Now, these are just a few thousand people in one location or another, but they're not actually going out and seeing all the pages that exist on Facebook. That would be impossible. So there's, what, an algorithm that's kind of sorting it through and then kind of held it, putting it up on a silver platter to them? That's right. So if you see something you don't like on Facebook, you can click a button to report it. And all of that goes into a big queue. Uh, and then that gets served up to these moderators, often in no particular order. So they sit down at their desk, they click a button that says resume reviewing uh, inside a custom piece of software that Facebook has, and then they just start seeing this 
massive posts and some of them will be very simple bullying, um, some of them will be very benign, and then some of them will be incredibly disturbing. It, tell me a little bit about the kind of ripple effects and the consequences of, I mean, you talked to a lot of different people for this story, some with the blessing of the employer and then quite a few who spoke to you on kind of the condition of anonymity. That's right. And uh, the reason for that is that Facebook requires all of these folks to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, that has some benefits. Um, it discourages them from talking about personal information of, face uh, of Facebook users. Um, and it also protects their safety. Uh, Facebook uh, you know, if, if folks knew that they were moderating content for Facebook, maybe Facebook removed one of their posts, you can imagine that that could lead to some, some pretty ugly confrontation. So those NDAs have a positive side to them, uh, but they also have a negative side, which is that a lot of the folks that I spoke with said they didn't even feel comfortable talking about their work with their, uh, their partners, their spouses, their family members, their close friends, because they were worried that they would be held legally liable for violating this NDA. And when you consider the kind of content that they're looking at and how uh, depressing uh, and upsetting some of that content is, that can put some of them into a very dark place, right, where they feel like they, can't, they don't have anyone that they can talk to. Mm -hmm. So I talked to a number of folks who told me that they had developed uh, symptoms uh, that closely resemble post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Um, and then in, a, in a sort, another sort of strange twist, uh, a lot of the moderators I spoke with said that the more that they reviewed content about sort of fringe conspiracy theories, the more they themselves came to believe it. And so a lot of the moderators I've spoken with now believe in some of the conspiracy theories that they'd been asked to moderate. You know, this is, um, you, this is a paragraph from your story I want to quote. The moderators told me it's a place where the conspiracy videos and memes that they see each day gradually lead them to embrace fringe views. One auditor walks the floor promoting the idea that the earth is flat. A former employee told me he has begun to question certain aspects of the Holocaust. Another former employee who told me he has mapped every escape route out of his house and sleeps with a gun at his side said, quote, I no longer believe 9-11 was a terrorist attack. And this is a result of the job that they're doing every every day. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, and certainly for me as a reporter, you know, uh, and we should say there's been some great reporting about content moderators uh, in the past at a variety of other outlets. A lot of it is linked in my piece. Mm -hmm. um, but that passage that you read contained some of the stuff that surprised me the most in my reporting. It was some stuff that I don't think has really been explored before. And that's the long-term effect that this work can have on folks. And, you know, keep in mind that many of the, the people that I've spoke with only do this job for about a year. Yeah. That's about as long as they can handle it. Um, not all of them make it that long. Uh, other folks get fired during, during training, for example. And so you might do this job for, you know, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, making $15 an hour, you get fired or you leave because it's too upsetting. And you're going to then have lasting psychological trauma, which, of course, Facebook is not going to pay for you to go get treatment for that. Yeah, I was going to say, let's just clarify here. The company that you went and profiled, this is not Facebook itself. This is basically like a subcontractor, right? So this is that Facebook writes a check to these folks, and these folks are at a separate company altogether. That's right. So Facebook and other tech platforms use this kind of call center model of content moderation. So there's a large handful of companies around the world, and their primary expertise is just in finding people and quickly plugging them into the system. So the one that I uh, spoke with was a company called Cognizant, which has a bunch of sites. There's another one called Genpack. There's another one called Accenture. And they all work in basically the same way. Facebook writes them a big check, says, we need a certain number of people to help us moderate all of the content that's getting reported. And then it's up to those companies to go out and kind of set things up. But we know Facebook will tell you it's very prescriptive about how those shops are set up. They want them to look a certain way. They want employees to have certain access to mental health care uh, resources while they work there, for example. 
So Facebook works very, very closely with these companies. And you know, uh, in, in my view, these moderators are Facebook employees in everything but you know name, um, because you know this is the only thing that they're working on. They only have these jobs because Facebook exists. All right. There's another graph in your story. I'm going to point out. It's it's a place where, in stark contrast to the perks lavished on Facebook employees, team leaders, micromanaged content moderators, every bathroom and prayer break, where employees desperate for a dopamine rush amid the misery have been found having sex inside stairwells and a room reserved for lactating mothers, where people develop severe anxiety while still in training and continue to struggle with trauma symptoms long after they leave, and where the counseling that Cognizant offers them ends the moment they quit or are simply let go. I mean, especially when you're talking about long-term consequences, the idea that you would no longer have access to the counselor or a group of counselors that might help you with the very thing that you've suffered through the job, the day after you leave that job, it's not like the problem stops. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And that's something that I hope we can continue paying more attention to in the months ahead. You know, when you think about other folks who have this kind of job, other people who are in first responder roles, a police officer, a firefighter, a social worker, um, in many cases, we think that those jobs are so important that we all collectively pay for them as taxpayers. And we give them pensions because we acknowledge the sacrifices that they have made so that we can have uh, a, a safe and, and free society. And I think that the time has come for us to shift our perspective on what these platforms are and on the value of the work that these folks are doing. Because again, if you take content moderation off of any social network, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, those places quickly become totally unusable. They're overrun by trolls, you and I would never want to spend any time there. And so because of the work that these folks are doing and because of the really disturbing stuff that they are uh, subjected to and work through, they, they create a safer world for the rest of us. And yet they can be fired for basically anything and then they never get any help from you know the company that put them into that position. So I do think that that is ripe for rethinking. Right, a couple of comments that are coming in. Uh, La Mantilla, Ron said, speech is free, but it needs to be monitored. Thank you, fellow moderators. Um, uh, you know, Tony Cazado asks, what do you think the higher-ups could do better? Decent question. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's two things that they could do basically overnight that would be great. The first thing they could do is pay these moderators more. So the average content moderator in Phoenix, where I wrote, makes $15 an hour. That's about $28,800 a year. When you look at other people in first responder roles, like a firefighter or police officer, it's not uncommon for us to pay them about $60,000 a year. I think that would create enormous benefits in the lives of all the folks that are doing this work. And it would actually acknowledge that work as, uh, as high-skilled labor, uh, you know, which it really is. So I would start by paying these folks more money. And then I think it's time to turn our attention to the working conditions in these jobs. You know, one of the things that I just couldn't get over about this story is that these moderators have to click a browser extension every time they want to use the bathroom. They're not allowed to leave their desk without telling someone why. I sort of think that if a Facebook executive had to live under that system for just one day, that system would be over that day. Um, and I think they could sort of extend the same freedoms that they enjoy during their work day uh, to their colleagues who are doing this, this work. So give them a little bit more agency, a little bit more freedom, treat them like the, the high skilled laborers that they are. Uh, another uh, comment that came in is that there's no, uh, this is from Anna DeVries, there's no need for freedom of speech on a privately owned company. Facebook needs to take steps to remove hate users. That's a pretty big idea, but it's really, really hard to institute, I'd imagine, on a scale as big as Facebook. Yeah, I mean, American social networks tend to be founded on the idea that they should maximize the amount of speech that is allowed on the platform, right? And that very much comes out of our values as Americans. We believe in the First Amendment. We believe in rigorous political debates. Um, and I think in a world where much of our discussion around politics has moved online, it's important to protect a lot of speech, including speech from people that we totally disagree with, or maybe we think are even acting uh, 
in bad faith. Um, but at the same time, there there are there are lines to be drawn. Uh, the tricky part is that it's hard to get all of us to agree on them. So you know, I would say to the the viewers uh, comment that Facebook has no right to you know, or no obligation to. Uh, allow all of us to have free speech. She, she is right. It is a private corporation. It can sort of draw the lines uh, wherever it wants to. Um, but I think that we should be cautious there because Facebook has an enormous amount of power and uh, you know a world in which it decides which are the correct opinions and which are the incorrect opinions and permits only the former on the site, that starts to feel like a pretty uh, dystopian world, at least to me. Yeah, all right. Uh, John Boyle also mentioned Facebook could easily afford to pay a living wage and good benefits. And again, this is a subcontractor that, uh, that is profiled in this story. Um, Andy Adams asks, shut or mentions, shut down Facebook and slowly reboot with a delayed time for posts to appear. You know, just in the in the wake of the New Zealand shootings, we saw, at least in a, a Washington Post piece about YouTube, that at some point they were just so overwhelmed that they just said, let's take the humans out of the mix and let the algorithm do the work. And if we err on the side of censoring too much right now, that's okay. We'll try to fix it in the coming days. Yeah, I mean, I do think that platforms might consider taking more heavy-handed actions in the wake of these calamities. Um, we now know that there's a pretty familiar playbook uh, that these trolls run whenever there is a mass shooting or another disaster. They will, you know, re-upload thousands of copies of the original uh, crime uh, if there was footage taken. They will make videos saying that the whole thing never happened and it's all a big hoax. And so I do think that there are steps where uh, these companies could take really heavy-handed action, you know, perhaps to uh, prohibit uploading for a couple of hours or something. Now, this gets really difficult yeah. at the scale of like a YouTube. Uh, you're going to affect a lot of really uh, well-meaning people who are maybe, you know, just trying to make a living uploading their own videos. So, you know, that stuff gets pretty tricky. But, you know, when you get down into the nitty gritty details, there are ways to do it. For example, you know, when people upload these terrible videos over and over again, often they're doing it from brand new accounts that don't have any verified contact information. So, you know, maybe in the aftermath of these calamities, platforms could just restrict uploads to um, accounts that are somewhat less established. All right. Casey Newton, Silicon Valley editor of The Verge. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure.